As you may know, we've been exploring the fundamental theme of refuge and finding refuge, taking refuge, and in other words, looking for those things, especially in turbulent times, that give us a sense of comfort, ease, protection, inspiration, nurturance, and so forth. What are those refuges? Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, three refuges in particular are identified, uh, which could be understood as the teacher, the teachings, and the community of the taught. Um, and we could also maybe kind of loosely relate those three Buddhist refuges to what I think of neurobiologically as the fundamental refuges of inner peace, inner contentment, and inner love. So we've been exploring these and uh, as uh, for its own value and as a frame in which I can offer some very fundamental Buddhist ideas and methods for you to see what has value for you. So today, tonight, I'd like to talk about what I've said is and what I believe to be the Buddha's fundamental insight as an individual who practiced himself who did not claim any divine inspiration or any supernatural powers, uh, through his own practices, he came to find what he called that highest happiness, which is peace and the end of suffering. So what did he realize? What was his core realization? And what did he offer to other people ever since? Uh, on a meditation retreat, I summarized for myself as a takeaway from that retreat in four words, uh, my own way of understanding his deep insight, which was, in my words, love more, cling less. <laughs> love more, cling less. And I'd like to explore uh, what I think is the Buddha's deep insight, and uh, you'll see how it relates to those four words that I offered, okay? So to begin with and to frame this, I'd like to read a bit from my book, Neurodharma, about what is suffering and why do we suffer? Uh, you know, as the Buddha said at one point, as best we know what he said, he said, I just teach one thing, suffering and its end. That was his central preoccupation, including subtleties of suffering. So do we suffer? Why do we suffer? And what can we do about it? So I want to create a bit of a frame, and in my frame, I'm going to kind of bang on and challenge some widely held sort of buddhist -y dogmas and really unpack them to get at what I think is most relevant here. Uh, I'll just read through the section in my book, starts on page 99, the section titled, Is Life Suffering? And it may seem a little technical in a couple of places, but it actually is very relevant to everyday life. And it's really about uh, becoming aware of our own experience in a very detailed and granular way. So here we go, and I invite, I ask you to bear with me as I read these essentially six pages. So is life suffering? A central Buddhist teaching is generally translated as all conditioned things are suffering. Conditioned is a shorthand way of saying that something exists due to various causes. It didn't just pop into being out of nowhere. For example, a wooden chair is the result of many factors, including the trees it came from and the people who made it. The sensations of breathing are also the result of many factors, such as the circuitry of the nervous system and whether you just took a big breath. In turn, these causes are themselves conditioned by their causes, ultimately widening out into the universe and back into time. Are all conditioned things indeed suffering? I don't think so. If we are to fulfill the task and the opportunity of understanding suffering, we need to unpack this teaching in order to find the way in which it is actually true. So I'd like to walk through different versions of it that I've encountered. Taken literally, all conditioned things are suffering, this statement cannot be true. All conditioned things can't be suffering. Suffering is an experience. A chair is a conditioned thing, a physical object 
that cannot have an experience and it cannot be an experience. So it would be wrong to say all chairs are suffering. A related version of this that I've heard is life is suffering. Yet, is it? Experiences, at least as this word is normally used, require a nervous system. Plants and microbes do not have nervous systems. Therefore, they can't have experiences, at least as we use that word, so they can't suffer. Bones and blood and neurons don't suffer either. This is not just semantics. Suffering is not out there in physical objects or in life as a whole. Most conditioned things are not suffering. It can feel startling and freeing to recognize that suffering is just a small part of everything. Let's suppose that the term conditioned things is meant to refer only to our experiences and not to physical objects such as chairs. Then a version of this statement could be, all human experiences are suffering. I also, by the way, in the footnotes uh, to the book, refer to the experiences of non-human animals, but I'm going to focus this on human beings. So then a version of this statement could be, all human experiences are suffering. Is this actually true? You could look inside yourself right now. Are all of your experiences suffering? There are times, certainly, when the mind is filled with physical pain, grief, fear, outrage, depression, or other overwhelming kinds of suffering. I've had those times myself, and then it feels like suffering is all there is. There are also countless people who each day must bear pain, illness, loss, disability, poverty, hunger, or injustice. And in the blink of an eye, something might happen, perhaps a car on the highway swerving into you, or a shocking betrayal by someone you've trusted that changes the rest of your life. Suffering is certainly around us, and often, if not always, inside us. Compassion calls us to do what we can about it, and still, are all of our experiences suffering? Suffering matters because it is a particular kind of experience, one that is unpleasant, so there must be other kinds of experiences. The pleasure in eating a juicy peach is not itself suffering, nor is virtue, wisdom, or concentration, the three fundamental pillars of Buddhist practice, which we can also find sometimes with other names in other traditions and in the secular world of psychology and self-help and human potential, virtue, wisdom, and concentration, mental training, concentration. Awareness itself is not suffering, is it? Human experience certainly contains fear and grief, but that's not all it contains. Further, any experience, even a painful one, is highly pixelated with many elements like the individual brushstrokes of a painting. Most of those elements are not themselves suffering. The redness of red, the knowledge that a ball is round, None of these is itself suffering. This can get really intense, can't it, when we look closely into our own experience and challenge, maybe, some dogmas that we've heard along the way. These points may seem really technical, but, we, but if we overlook what is not suffering, then we won't truly understand what is suffering and its causes and we will miss out on experiences and resources that we could use both for increasing health and well-being and for reducing suffering, actual suffering. Recognizing suffering in yourself and others opens the heart and motivates practice, but these good ends are not served by exaggerating it. So let's get even narrower and consider this statement. Human experiences, even loving, beautiful, inspiring ones, always have some suffering in them. This is a version of teachings that I've heard along the way in my own training. This seems a lot closer to what could be true, but why would pixels of suffering 
always be present somewhere in the movie of consciousness. At this point, it's helpful to think of suffering in a broader and looser way as that which is unsatisfactory or unsatisfying. And this is a very useful way to talk about suffering, particularly in the context of deep contemplative practice, that which is unsatisfying or unsatisfactory. But we still need to clear away some underbrush. In the immediate moment of an experience, perhaps there is the smell of cinnamon or the recognition that a job is done. The smell or recognition is just what it is, and it is not itself unsatisfying. Some might say that it is the inevitable ending, the impermanence of all experiences that makes them always unsatisfying. But impermanence alone cannot be the problem, since some kinds of impermanence are welcomed, <laughs> such as the impermanence of pain makes room for pleasure. And even if the ending of each moment of experience is a loss, it is balanced by the gain of each new moment that arises. This is the important point. Yes, because all experiences are impermanent, they cannot be permanently, continuously satisfying. But this becomes a problem only when we try to hold on to them. Bingo. The suffering, stress, or dissatisfaction is not inherent in experience itself or in its impermanence. It's not inherent. It is inherent only in the holding on to experiences. It's good to slow down and really appreciate the implications of this. We must still face the inescapable physical and emotional pains of life and the inescapable transience of all experiences, even the ones we like best. But we need not suffer these facts as long as we can practice letting go instead of holding on. This is central. This speaks to our suffering and, as the Buddha taught, the end of suffering. So as I write here, how could we do this? We just have about one page to go. Two kinds of holding. There are two kinds of holding. First, we tend to hold on to what the Buddha called the four objects of attachment. And you might use the Buddhist typology as a way to reflect upon your own experience and what gets you into trouble when you hold on to things and what feels better when you loosen your grip and relax and let go. First, we hold on to pleasures, which, if you reverse the valence of this, can include the resisting of or the holding on to the pushing away of that which is unpleasant, that which is painful, first. Second, we hold on to views, opinions, beliefs, expectations, being right. I know about that one. We also hold on to what the, is translated traditionally as rites and rituals. Uh, you could think of the Buddha's critique of the empty rituals of his time and the priest class who performed them. More modernly, if that's an adverb, we could say uh, rules and routines. You know, we hold on to the, our rules, our procedures, the ways we do things. The sock drawer has to be organized in a particular kind of way. Every day we walk the dog at a certain time. You know, we can get kind of attached to that. We hold on to that. Someone brought up narratives. Narratives would be a kind of view, right, that we hold on to our stories about ourselves and other people, the meanings we give them. That's an example of views, broadly defined. And then last, oh, and not least of all, we hold on to the sense of self. You know, we hold on to uh, identifying with things and possessing things uh, and kind of defending and glamorizing the self. So these are four 
gross forms of holding on. For example, I know what it's like to want some ice cream, but then find that the container is empty. So I'm walking through the four categories here. You might think of your own examples. I know what it's like to want some pleasure in the ice cream, but then find that the container is empty. Whoa. I know what it's like to have a strong opinion that no one should ever take the last bit of ice cream without seeing if I want some too. They don't know how to do things. Huh. Also, I know what it's like to want a new rule about this in my home. Now we have a new routine, a new rule. And I know what it's like to feel annoyed that someone took my precious ice cream. This kind of holding is a form of craving, which the Buddha referred to, of course, in his second noble truth. It's a kind of craving, broadly defined, and you can observe it with mindfulness. Like everything else in awareness, craving increases and decreases, ebbs and flows. With practice, you can get more comfortable with letting go instead of holding on, which is a theme throughout this book and throughout our work with each other in this meditation gathering and in your own personal practice, if you like. You can get more comfortable with letting go instead of holding on. Also, as we can see, and we'll be exploring this, especially when I get to uh, the refuge of the Buddhist teachings and the psychobiological, neuropsychological refuge of contentment, fullness, you can feel already full, already at ease, and therefore less driven to hold on to any moment at all. In other words, as we feel increasingly filled up already, as we rest increasingly, in a, in a sense of enoughness, enoughness of safety, satisfaction, and connection, there's less and less fuel for the holding on and the drivenness of craving that the Buddha talked about. That's a beautiful thing, to gradually internalize experiences of needs met enough already, so there's less and less internalized basis for craving at all. Even at its most intense, the first kind of holding, in any case, is only a part of consciousness and alongside that form of holding, that form of craving, there are other things. It's not the whole of consciousness, which is incredible and wonderful to appreciate. And with practice, this first kind of holding, remember two kinds of holding, gradually releases. <sighs> what a relief. It's like moving from your fist, contracted all the time, you know, to a gradual easing and a letting go. And then to finish with the final paragraph here. But there is a second kind of holding that actually is inherent in life itself. Intrinsically, the nervous system is always attempting to stabilize and segment extremely dynamic and interconnected processes. To serve the life of the body it inhabits, the nervous system keeps trying to hold on to the patterns of activation that underlie each moment of experience, even as they keep dispersing and morphing into something else inside the nervous system. When your mind is quiet and steady, you can really see this, this subtle form of holding, essentializing, thingifying, you know, dynamic and turbulent processes. This second kind of holding that's innate in life and life with a nervous system, this second kind of holding produces an ongoing subtle tension, trying to hold on to experiences that are disappearing through our fingers, even as we try continually to grasp them, to make sense of them, to manage them. The second kind of holding produces an ongoing subtle tension that is indeed a form of suffering. It remains even when your mind is really quiet meditatively. It's still there. This tension is not the only thing we experience, but it is a part of everything we experience. 
In this particular sense, in this narrow and particular sense, suffering is indeed an inherent feature of our lives. While we cannot remove this tension, since it is grounded in our biology, we can understand it, which brings a sense of clarity and calm. Oh, that's why, subtly, in the back of my mind, there is this contraction somehow, this holding, this uneasiness, even when I'm at my most peaceful. Oh, and when you understand it, like I said, it brings clarity and calm. It's not personal. <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> what a relief. Additionally, if we can accept this property of the nervous system and not resist it, then we don't add suffering to suffering. It's just what's there. This kind of holding is just what brains do. In this life, there is always some tension somewhere, but amidst and around it can be so many other things, such as an open heart, the undisturbed spaciousness of awareness, <clears throat> and thankfulness for the good that is real. Okay. So in a moment, I want to open it up for questions about this fundamental teaching about suffering. What is also present, the two kinds of holding. We could say two forms of craving in the broadest sense, two kinds of holding that make us suffer and how we can practice with them. But before I open it up, I want to talk about a kind of corollary, a kind of implicit element in the Buddha's fundamental insight about what can we do to ease the two kinds of holding. He was trained in a profoundly ascetic, renunciate, life-denying tradition of his time. And he developed great meditative attainments within it while nearly killing himself with starvation. And there's some very dramatic accounts of how emaciated uh, he had become. But he wasn't able to break through. He wasn't able to come to that final release. And so he wondered why. And then it came to him as he describes his own journey very, very intimately and vulnerably, actually. It came to him that there was a time when he was young and a boy, maybe around 10, some kind of event in the traditions of his time, sitting under a tree, dropping into a very peaceful, very easy state of being. Peaceful, contented, happy. And he asked himself, is this experience, was that experience bad for me? And he concluded, no, it wasn't bad for me. And in fact, he asked himself, could experiences like that actually be helpful in my practice? And he thought, yes, they could be. Is there anything wrong with them? No. Do I need to push them away? No. And on the basis of that, he allowed himself to receive, as the folklore has it, a gift of rice and milk from a passing uh, young woman nearby. And he took that sustenance. He allowed himself to receive a wholesome pleasure, a wholesome form of nurturance in support of his passion for awakening. And soon thereafter, as, as the, the folklore has it, he found himself beneath the Bodhi tree and through the three watches of that night came to his ultimate liberation. And so he then taught the middle way that on the one hand, we can give up the drivenness and holding on of the first kind of craving, the first kind of holding on through wisdom and practice and development. We can, we can let go of that, while on the other hand, this is the middle way, while on the other hand, not turning away from, as he put it, the happiness visible in this present life, the wholesome joys, the wholesome gladness in recognizing your own goodness, which 
he recommended. The wholesome pleasures of love and family and, and a sense of accomplishment and gratitude and, and doing what we can to help others with compassion. You know, part of our wholesome aspirations is to do what we can for others. We can stay in touch with those wholesome aspirations, those wholesome desires. We can find pleasure in a meal with friends and walking the dog and laughing at a cat video on YouTube. It's okay. It's okay. In fact, it can serve our practice um, and fuel us, and we can take refuge in these wholesome, ordinary, beneficial experiences of everyday life. We can take refuge in them and use them to protect us and inspire us and uh, nourish us and nurture us in our journey of practice. It's okay. It's okay. And before I now turn it to you and your your questions may be coming in the chat and comments, which I'll speak to. It's a very succinct and concise way for me to, to uh, respond to people. Also, I try to get at least one person's voice into the room and ask you to speak succinctly about what I've talked about tonight. Um, I want to just speak to the last form, the second form of holding, and the cessation, too, of that kind of holding, which is uh, addressed in the Third Noble Truth and translated in Pali as Naroda, cessation. In the meditative trainings that are laid out in Buddhist practice, and we can find analogs to this and other traditions around the world, including in secular mindfulness today, people move through classically what's called right concentration. Uh, wise concentration is one of the eight elements of the Eightfold Path. And in that process, the mind becomes progressively quieter and quieter and quieter and conditioned, ordinary experiences gradually, gradually cease until there's the final whew, cessation of all conditioned experiences in this description. I have not myself had that state of being. I've known numerous people who have sane, <laughs> grounded, <laughs> effective. Some of them are business consultants, <laughs> real people. Some of them are lawyers, <laughs> you know, real people who've really trained in this way. It's, a, it's available to us. It's, it's laid out in the Buddhist path. And I think that is where people report uh, truly a cessation of ordinary forms of consciousness. And then in a coming back from that cessation experience, they can witness the gradual reconstruction of ordinary forms of consciousness and ordinary forms of holding. So there is actually in the Buddhist path uh, a way to release both kinds of holding. The first gross kind in which we can be attached to, you know, getting pleasures and avoiding pains, or second, attached to our views, or third, attached to rules and routines, rites and rituals, or fourth, attached even to the sense of self. We can release that uh, grosser form of holding and craving and then release the suffering it causes. And we can also, uh, in deep, profound, pretty unusual, but still attainable forms of meditative practice, we can even release that second form of holding as well. And completely let go of any and all suffering in that cessation. Okay. Pretty good stuff, huh? Pretty deep. We can relate to it initially, intellectually, conceptually, that's okay. And increasingly, as we release that first form of holding, and maybe even in deep practice, typically on retreat, um, even approach a release of that second kind of holding as well. All right, so I'm gonna to speak to some questions and comments that have come in and um, take it from here, all right? And I, by the way, I want to appreciate you for staying with it while we're getting into pretty central, fundamental stuff, okay? So uh, a question came in from Anushka I wanna to speak to. Can I speak to the clinging, the holding? Here we go to the sense of self and clinging. Uh, big topic, uh, I'll explore it uh, more later on. Um, think about the ways in which we get possessive, like mine. That's a, that's a, there's a lot of sense of self in that. Or think about the ways that in your own little inner mini movies, 
there is both a me that you're thinking about, you know, what's it going to be like for me or how was it for me, you know, in terms of resentments, let's suppose, or hopeful fantasies of some future pleasure you're going to get. And just notice the sense of self in that. Now, here's a key point. We have experiences continually, right? We hear things, we see things, we think things. In the streaming of consciousness, think of the eddies in that stream, the ripples moving through it, or the flotsam and jetsam moving through the streaming of consciousness. Sounds here, desires there. Oh, the sense of self. Oh, a righteously held opinion. Oh, a wounded narcissistic injury. Feeling hurt and let down by other people. Oh, coming and going, right? No problem. The only problem is when we hold on. It's when we hop on board. And th there's a very interesting and very important form of practice uh, that I think is enormously wholesome in which as very social beings, we deliberately can internalize healthy social supplies, genuine experiences of feeling seen, included, appreciated, liked, and loved. Take those in. And so gradually, interestingly, as we internalize the sense of um, being cared about as a person, the sense of self can increasingly ease. That's a deep form of practice. And um, what's useful about this, I think, is not get into abstract, even you know, theological discussions of the self, the soul, whatnot, you know, but really focus on it experientially and observe that we can operate and engage life as persons in very skillful and effective ways, and we can stand up for persons. We can protect persons, including this person, uh, and we can pursue legitimate aspirations and aims for this person, and we can support the pursuit of legitimate aspirations and aims, and we decide what's legitimate, what's reasonable, but we got to make decisions. There's no way around that. Um, for other people. We can do all those things with, without, you know, wh while holding our sense of self lightly and being very careful about privileging those particular old boots and twigs and leaves floating along in the stream of consciousness. The, you know, you think about all the contents of consciousness, which ones do we tend to most privilege? It's typically the ones that have to do or that refer to me or I or mine. Okay, another question or comment? Let's see here. Good, I love how you're engaged with this. This is good. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Um, okay, from Tim, how do we have a healthy amount of pride and accomplishment? Uh, if we've been conditioned that pride is unwholesome. Very important. So um, I, I, what I, my approach to this a, a lot is to think of what I call the friend test. So if we had a friend or a child, or let's suppose we were working with people in a helping way as an educator, a therapist, a coach, a mindfulness teacher, and we see something that uh, we appreciate about another person, uh, we would maybe communicate that with them and we would wish for them that they can take in our authentic, not manipulative, genuine appreciation of them and respect for them, and take in that sense of being able to appreciate and respect themselves, much like they would appreciate and respect another person. So if it's okay to appreciate and respect another person, to value another person, well, it should be okay for us. Otherwise, it's a double standard. The golden rule is a two-way street. We should do unto ourselves the good which we do unto others. And if we would wish for the other person to take in our respect for them, our appreciation of them, um, if we would say to another person, you know, hey, you got that thing done, it's okay to recognize that you accomplished that and you accomplished that with with virtue and tenacity and endurance and and with some of the talents that you have. Uh, so, and, you know, obviously privilege and advantage of different kinds are in the mix too. And still, and also, there are, are your own virtues that you can appreciate, right? We would wish for them to take it in. We'd think, you know, it's actually deserved <laughs> for you to feel good about yourself here. And also, it would be 
healing. You would heal some of your stuff that sometimes can actually create maybe issues for other people, you know? And so we can realize that actually it can be benevolent for them to internalize, yeah, I'm pretty okay after all. <laughs> See? Because as we truly internalize it, we tend to become less of a jerk, caught up in trying to impress other people or work them to approve of us. Oh, that's pretty pretty cool to appreciate that. So that's that's one way into it, you know, that can help you clarify. You're asking a very principled question here, which is, and it's helpful to kind of clarify the principles involved. So then you kind of clear the decks and you go, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Bring a spoon, <laughs> swallow, <laughs> take it in. Okay, good. All right. So let's see here. Is there, I'm going to kind of you bet. You betcha. And this is something I've been work I've worked a lot on myself. Now we have to be careful because like pleasures, it's a yellow flag, right? Sensual pleasures are a yellow flag because the brain is designed to want what it likes. Social pleasures are a yellow flag because we can, you know, get a little too caught up in them, maybe. We, you know, we get a little hungry. And one of the real keys here, paradoxically, is to internalize the experience so that it's gradually woven into our brains. It's woven into the marrow of our being in a very embodied and experienced way. So that, more and more, feeling already full, we don't feel the need to reach for it outside ourselves so much anymore. Take it in while being, you know, yellow flag. You can still race around the track, still have a good time, still try to win, but yellow flag. Okie doke. All right. So let's see, anybody have a question related to what I've talked about? Is all life suffering actually? Right? What makes, what actually creates the suffering that we add to life? Right? Anybody want to speak to that? Just kind of raise your hand. I'm going to bounce through the screens. Uh, if I don't call on you and you have a hand raised, it's not because I dislike you. I may not have seen you. Any question or comment? No? Nobody? Okie doke. All right. Okay. okay, I see Pamela. Great. Thank you, Pamela. So I'm unmuting you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I did have a question. I've heard that routine is something that's recommended for people with anxiety. And yet that's one of the things that you mentioned in the uh, objects of attachment. So I was just wondering your thoughts on that. That's a wonderful question, Pamela, in part because it illustrates a broader point. Um, in that, so just about anxiety, um, you know, I have myself a little, I have a tendency toward, you know, of the temperaments, we all have a temperament. <laughs> I tilt a little anxious rather than melancholy or irritable. I tilt a little that way. Uh, and um, so it, it is said that action binds anxiety. So having a routine, knowing what your plan is, knowing how you see things, um, you know, having things in their, in their place so that you don't have to keep thinking about where is that or have I done that, that's useful. It's useful. And it's a bit of a yellow flag because if, like me, you have, I'm going to joke here, at least one of the 10 genes for OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, you can get a little too into it, right? And so it to be, it's like I was saying earlier, it can be like a yellow flag. And it speaks to the larger point, which the Buddha offered as sort of his, in his metaphor of the raft, key metaphor, that as we approach a river of suffering, we construct a vehicle to help ourselves. And we use it as a means to an end. But once it accomplishes its purpose, we don't keep holding on to it. We don't keep carrying it around as we walk around the other side of the river. And so in that way, it's important to keep asking ourselves, what's our relationship to our skillful means? Are we able to hold them lightly with wisdom? Uh, my, my kind of three criteria are, and you know, we practice with these three criteria. It's not like it's a sin to violate them. If there's your trainings. One, are the, are the ends wholesome? And we decide, is it, is it beneficial? For ourselves and probably for other, maybe for others too, but you know, do we go, okay, that's an okay thing to pursue. 
it's okay to have certain routines. It's okay to just prefer that your sock drawer is orderly, uh, just, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Fine. Second, is it pursued with, with wholesome means? Like, for example, we can want to organize our drawers, but if we get all neurotic about it, if we get all driven about it, if we start yelling at people who dare to disturb our perfect sock drawer, you know, that's not, that's not, whole, that's not skillful means. So wholesome ends with wholesome means while being fundamentally at peace with whatever happens. Now, we may not like it. We may have a very heavy heart, understandably. We may be honestly outraged at injustice for ourselves and maybe and especially other people, while in the core of our being, there's an unshakable, deep, deep, deep serenity and stillness inside. Now with practice, it can take practice to find that. But these are the three. So it would be like, okay, it's appropriate to organize my drawer and have routines and that. And I'm gonna go about it with minimal neuroticism, you know, <laughs> and I'll, you know, I'll dial it back if it gets a little too intense, all right? While playing around with, you know, can I still feel fundamentally okay in this life with all of its difficulties and all of its joys and opportunities and amazingness? is if, phew, God forbid, someone messes with your sock drawer. Okay, great. And that's a, that's a really good summary of a lot of practice, right? So we're going to finish up in a, in a minute or so here. And I'd like to uh, kind of bring it to an end in a, in a bit of a formal way, reminding you that if you want to stick around, um, you can... Um, you know, five minutes after we end officially, Tom will assign you into breakout rooms uh, that you can that are optional for you. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think I've got about a minute left. I see your hand raised, Nadine, but unfortunately, I, I do need to end here. I don't see your question, Nadine, in the chats. I'll speak here to a question that came in privately to me. Um, but it really get, and then we'll, we'll end kind of formally. Okay, great. So the question is, you said that the second kind of suffering we cannot get rid of, but then you said the Buddha did overcome it. Confused. Very helpful for you to clarify that. I'm observing in a way that makes sense to me as a neuropsychologist and someone who's done pretty deep meditations and still observed some very subtle forms of contraction even at the quietest. What's going on with that? So I do, it is my opinion, um, that there is an inherent subtle form of holding in ordinary consciousness. It is involved with the sometimes called essentializing or just the holding on of experiences to make sense of them, to kind of segment them from each other and to grasp them, to understand them, even as they evaporate. And in the meditative path laid out by the Buddha, and in ways that people I know quite well, including some teachers of mine, have experienced, there can be an end to ordinary consciousness. And in that cessation of ordinary consciousness, pointed to in the Third Noble Truth, I think in that unusual but attainable, non-ordinary state of being, there is a cessation of ordinary consciousness. And in that cessation, there is a cessation of that second kind of holding on. That's what I mean there. Taking it a step further in the practice of timelessness that I explore in my book, it could also be true potentially that in that cessation of conditioned ordinary consciousness that's well described in the meditative path and in modern meditative teachers of real attainment, uh, such as Tina Rasmussen and Stephen Snyder, Lee Brasington, Shala Catherine, a number of other people. Um, and I'm speaking of those in the Buddhist tradition, and you can find analogs in other traditions. It could well be, I think, and some people really teach this, that in that cessation of ordinary conditioned consciousness, whew, there is an opening into transcendental 
unconditionality that is meaningfully distinct from ordinary natural processes within the Big Bang universe. Not everybody goes to that interpretation. Fine if you don't. I'm not trying to persuade you, but I'm trying to name an additional way to understand that. And as we finish here, letting it sink in, bringing it down to experience. What's it like to be you? What are you experiencing? Right? When is there suffering? When is there not suffering? In your own experiences, in your own consciousness, in just your, your stream of experiences, what is not suffering? Oh, why is it not suffering? Oh, and how can you increasingly let go? As Ajahn Chah taught in the quotation that I sent out uh, with the information about this meditation, if you let go a little, you'll have a little peace, he taught. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you will be completely peaceful. So let's sit with this for a minute, and then I'll ring the bell. We'll end formally, and those that remain will be moved into the breakout rooms. Let's just sit together for a minute. Let it land, whatever's beneficial, aware and letting go. And next week, I'll emphasize how to pursue wholesome ends with wholesome means while being at peace with whatever happens. I'm going to focus on that in particular. I look forward to seeing you then.